we welcome Hal for defeating plant obsolescence for Cisco Meraki switches. Thank you very much. This is, ah, here we go, perfect. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's very early, um, but uh, we'll get down to business here. Uh, so quick agenda for this talk. I'm um, going to give you some background on how I got involved in this. Uh, we'll talk about who are Meraki, their business model, and I'll have a short political manifesto. Um, don't worry, it's only about the first third of the talk. Then we're going to get into talking about Meraki's firmware internals, um, the devices that I researched, um, the custom firmware that I've come up with, and some future work and kudos. So the background here, it was 2019, and like every aspiring home labber, I wanted 10 gigabit networking, but I wanted it on the cheap. I didn't want to pay for a proper switch. Um, so I knew there was a modded firmware available for the Meraki MS220 switch, and I found an MS42, which is a larger version of the uh, MS220 on eBay for 50 pounds, and this was before the UK left the EU, so it was like, yes, don't even have to pay VAT. Um, and, uh, or duties. And uh, yeah, so just, you know, blindly assumed it would apply to the hardware and bought it. But now we have to go back. Let's talk about Meraki. They were founded in 2006 by some MIT graduates. Um, they were acquired by Cisco in 2012. And they make networking equipment that's cloud managed. So if you want to buy a, a switch or an access point, a router, um, IP camera from them, they'll happily sell that to you. Um, and this is my opinion only, but they're not very good at GPL compliance. Um, and we'll come back to that later. So Meraki's business model is that you have a network that you want to manage, but managing network assets is hard. So uh, Meraki will kindly punch a hole through your NAT and make a tunnel to their cloud so that you can manage all your devices through their cloud. So you buy the hardware, you pay a license to them, and you get a dashboard where you can see all your network assets and manage them. And you look like this cool llama after you've done that. Um, except, well, if you're a Meraki customer, you probably know this, but to, you know, to, to hackers, it might come as a surprise that um, licenses cost money, and Meraki is not going to let you manage uh, your equipment for free. But they're really, really, really benevolent, and so uh, if you ever uh, you know, become out of compliance because you forgot to pay your invoice or something, you've got 30 days uh, before they pull the plug on your network, um, and that means that all your devices will not only stop being uh, managed, but they'll stop passing packets. And so better pay up within 30 days, because Meraki is the captain now. I want to read this quote. It's from their website. Cisco Meraki may find it necessary to discontinue products for a number of reasons, including product line enhancements, market demand, technology innovation, or if the product simply matures over time and needs to be replaced by something functionally richer. A few moments later, did someone say hardware refresh? Meraki decide to end of life your hardware. And now, not only are you no longer able to purchase the hardware that you have in your network, but you may no longer be able to purchase licenses for that hardware, which means you need to buy new hardware. Well, what if you say, forget the cloud? Maybe I'll just manage it myself. Meraki say, that's the neat part, you don't. So the TLDR here is that you don't own your devices. What you've got is an expensive lease. And in my opinion, Meraki sales salivate at the thought of deprecating existing products because it means they get to sell you new ones. It also removes the secondary market for resale. If you purchase a device which is previously claimed in the Meraki dashboard, and the previous owner has not released that device in the dashboard, you will be unable to add it to the dashboard and manage it yourself. Now, this is maybe not a problem for legitimate resellers, but if you ever purchase a Meraki device, say, from a company that's gone bankrupt, and the previous IT department you know, was laid off, then the device will still be claimed in Meraki's dashboard, and you'll have bought a brick. So here's my political manifesto moment. We need some sim log reg regulation for these devices. Networking devices these days typically run Linux. And since Linux is GPL, you can request the source code from the vendor and build your own firmware. But as vendors are moving towards more secure devices, you may not be able to actually run your firmware on the device, leaving you with a brick. Other vendors have or are considering subscription models similar to what Meraki does. And there's no reason for these devices to become e-waste. We need to remember the second R and the three R's, reuse. There's no reason for these devices to become e-waste if we have regulation that says we should be able to run our own software on them. They shouldn't be locked to the vendor. Now, that's my political manifesto slide over. Let's get into the actual technical details. So Meraki's firmware has a boot process like 
everything. Uh, the bootloader varies depending on which hardware we're talking about. Um, the MS220 switch, which is sitting here in front of me, is a MIPS, and it uses Red Boot. Meraki's newer switches use ARM, and they use U-Boot. When you have U-Boot, the environment is compiled into U-Boot, and there's auto-boot enabled with no delay, so there's no easy way to break into the system through U-Boot and a console. For x86 devices, they use Core Boot with a loader called MILES, which stands for Meraki Intermediate Loader for Embedded Systems. It's based on Philo, and it basically just looks for a fit image, loads the kernel, and jumps to it. Let's talk about fit images. Meraki hardware sometimes has a two-stage boot process. The first stage will be a boot kernel. That's their term, not mine. It handles initializing hardware. It's typically stored on SPI, and it's what the boot ROM of the uh, ASIC will read from. And it handles setting up UBI, reading from NAND. It even supports LVM and EXT4. And it'll load in KEXEC into the second stage firmware, which Meraki calls a part. The part is the real Meraki firmware, which manages the hardware, connects to Meraki's cloud, pulls the configuration, and applies it. The rootfs is always compiled into the kernel image, both in the boot kernel and the part. There's no separate partition on Flash for that. Meraki switch firmwares. Um, because they're ex-MIT people, they developed something really nice called Click Router, which replaces a lot of typical network functions in Linux. I myself am not a fan, but Meraki uses it in all their products. They also have a monolithic binary on switches called SwitchBrain, which manages the switch configuration. It basically reads the configuration file that it pulls from Meraki's cloud servers and applies it using Click. There's a tunnel created back to the Meraki cloud called mTunnel. I think it's loosely based on IPsec, but I haven't really dug into it too much because they use TLS cert pinning for everything, even fetching the configuration over mTunnel and especially when downloading and upgrading firmware. So if you're thinking about man in the middling Meraki's configuration or firmware upgrade process, forget that now because it will fail. The target devices that I looked at in my research are the MS220, which I have the 10-port version here in front of me, the MS210 and 225 series, and the MS120 series. The reason that I looked at these is because they're what I have available. Um, I don't have a, a nice corporate sugar daddy who has a data center that runs Meraki equipment, um, so I don't get this stuff for free. I have to buy it and search for deals. Uh, just a quick overview of all of them. They're all pretty similar. They have uh, gigabit Ethernet ports, and some of them have SFP Plus ports and stacking as well. Uh, but yeah, they have a variety of bootloaders, Red Boot on the old stuff, U-Boot on the new stuff. They have different vendors, so it's Vitesse, which is now owned by Microchip on the MS220 series. There's Broadcom used on the MS210 and 225, and Marvell is used on the MS120 series. Meraki loves the 3.18 kernel. I've yet to see anything newer on their Switch series. And ASIC management is typically via kernel modules or via user space binaries. Of particular note, none of these are open source. They're provided by the vendor through their SDK. So even if you manage to get the GPL source code from Meraki, you won't be able to run a mainline kernel because all the ASIC goodness happens in closed source things. And of course, they all run click. And one thing to note about the MS120 series, it has secure boot. So let's talk about secure boot on Meraki devices. Meraki calls this, well, Cisco calls this the ACT, which stands for Anti-Counterfeit Technology. Meraki lingo is TAM, Trusted Authentication Module. It's based on the microchip Smart Fusion 2, which is a small FPGA, which is either available in a surface mount or BGA package. It's included in all their new product designs since around 2018. This includes MS switches and MX routers. It's used to implement a hardware root of trust, and it's used as part of the secure boot chain, as well as part of the update process. So when a uh, Meraki device with a TAM requests a configuration or an update, it also provides a secret from the TAM to Meraki servers to prove its authenticity. Um, they basically followed the microchip white paper on how to implement this, and uh, yeah, it, they, they've done their homework. U-Boot uh, is a binary that's signed and verified by the boot ROM or the secondary payload loader, and U-Boot then handles verifying the signature of the fit image, and um, that's what it looks like in U-Boot. So a U-Boot applet runs, U-Boot applets are not subject to GPL, um, U-Boot developers have been pretty clear on this for several decades, I think. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, during the boot process, uh, it, the FPGA has both an A and B firmware, and it has signature lists. The signature lists are converted into an FTT during uh, U-Boot initialization, and then that's used to verify the fit image that it then boots. Uh, and this applies both to devices that have a single-stage boot process and a two-stage boot process. So my hacky solution here, Meraki devices run Linux. So let's obtain the GPL source code from them. Let's build our own firmware. Step three is up to your imagination, and step four is profit, although this is open source, so no. Um, I call this post merc OS. It's a play on words from post-market OS, which you may know from phones. It's post-Meraki OS. 
Uh, it's an open source firmware. Uh, the most mature target is the MS220 because that's what I've been working on for the longest. There is a pre-alpha for the MS210 and 225 series because the MS210 and 225 are actually the same hardware inside. Um, it's based on build root, just because that's what I'm familiar with. You flash it via SPI because NAND tools are expensive and NAND is hard to work with. Um, and it uses ve the vendor kernel. So we're stuck on 3.18 because that's the kernel modules that I have and um, I don't have access to rebuild those. And there's local management via SSH and your standard BusyBox CLI. Um, MS120, there may eventually be a firmware or not, depends if we can manage to find some holes in their secure boot implementation. So future work, um, data sheets are really hard to come by and none of the vendors want to give them to you unless you give them lots and lots and lots of money and promise never to share them with anyone else. So if anyone knows of a random server where I can find them, I would be really, really grateful. Um, I know vendors like Broadcom and Marvell are not eager to give up that information. Uh, mainline o or OpenWRT support may be possible on the smaller MS220 series um, because uh, Microchip has an SDK which includes um, support for the LUTIN26, which is the ASIC used in the smaller uh, switches, which actually has a very recent kernel. Uh, however, the Jaguar 1 chip, which is used in the 48-port uh, versions, uh, there's no data sheet and there's no support in Microchip's SDK. So it's unclear if there will ever be support uh, for OpenWRT or mainline kernels. Another possibility is creating a Franken firmware. Um, the BCM56160, which is in the MS210 and 225 series, is used in other switching products from other vendors, such as Aris and Quanta. Um, so, you know, we could potentially just lift components from their firmwares and run them on Meraki hardware and then have a more traditional switch. Um, so I want to give some kudos here. I'm not the only person working on giving Meraki devices a second life. Um, Leo Lung has some notes on the MS220, which inspired uh, my work. Riptide Wave 93 and Clayface are both working on OpenWRT support for other Meraki devices, and it's great to see other people in the community working to prevent e-waste. I want to give some negative kudos here too. Meraki GPL is really, really hard to get. Um, they don't provide a written offer with their products as far as I know. They don't mention any GPL software used in their dashboard. And there's no officially documented way to contact them to request a GPL source code. So if you have a Meraki product, whether you're interested in open source or not, please email open-source at meraki.com and ask them for the GPL source code for your product. However, you may wait a long, long, long time. I've waited over a year for certain products for them uh, to provide the source code. Um, so yeah, not very cool of them since they're using GPL software and uh, making it difficult to get the source code. But you know, I can see why because it's late stage capitalism. And we've been here before. After Cisco bought Linksys in the early 2000s, it also became very hard to get GPL source code for their products. And it took a, a lawsuit from the Free Software Foundation to change that. So um, yeah, hope it doesn't end up in court again and that they see the light of uh, contributing back to the community, but we'll see. So I have a, a very short demo, and uh, I hope the demo gods will uh, shine on me, although I did have some uh, pre-preparation. So uh, this is uh, SSH from the presentation laptop to the switch, which is running right here. Um, th there's nothing really too exciting to show you here, um, because it's all pretty basic. Um, but uh, so there you can see all the ports on the switch. Um, I'm plugged into port four, so you know, got a gigabit link there. And um, I also wrote a, a daemon to query uh, the PoE uh, and configure it. So you can uh, see the status of the PoE ports. I don't have any PoE devices here, so there's not really much to show. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what I've got. So thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. Um, I'm available for questions off to the side. And yeah, if you... Uh, own a Meraki device or work for someone who deploys Meraki devices, please email them and ask for the source code and throw it up on GitHub. Um, I think we can work together to show them the light. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Hal.